It is great to be able to begin Advent, to hear that beautiful music, the promise of light coming back into the world. And that's what we do as the days get shorter and the clouds get darker and the rains get deeper and deeper this morning. Um, we are reminded that the light of Christ is coming into the world. Uh, Advent kind of sometimes turns into, oh my goodness, we've got to get the nursery ready for the new baby. We're all about, oh, we've got to get everything painted. We've got to get a new bed. We've got to, we've got to get, oh, it's all about the new baby. But Advent really isn't just about a baby. In fact, some folks who are now scholars are saying that it's not really about the baby at all. I'm not ready to let go of that yet. But I do think there is a, a, a dichotomy. There is a, a, a dual role of Advent. Yes, we're anticipating the arrival of Christ at the center of our lives and center of our world through the season of Advent. But we're also being reminded of the return of Christ. The promise that, that God just didn't like start the world out and say, forget it, y'all do what you want to do. God still is a part of the world, concerned and cared. And that scripture over and over and over again promises us the hope of a new heaven and a new earth, that all that is wrong will be made right, that God's goodness will prevail for our lives and for the whole world. And I don't know, but we takes, it takes some time for us to be able to figure that out and to let it resonate in our hearts and our minds. The goodness of what God has given to us. If we were to get it all at one time, we just, our brains, our hearts, our minds, all that we are can't understand it, can't fathom the goodness of God. And so little by little, we begin to analyze it. As we do, kind of like a scientific experiment, we begin to divide and parse it out. So today we think about part of the hope that God gives to us and to our world. There's hope that it's going to be better. There's hope that the goodness will prevail. There's hope that God's love will be felt and understood and shared. There's hope, hope, hope. But we wait. Preachers, they say in preacher courses, shouldn't always be the hero of the story. Let me tell you about the time I waited. So when I had COVID, and I thought, oh, I can get over this. I'd gone on, it went on and on and on, and I said, I'm going to the emergency room. It was just before a holiday weekend, and I said, I'm going to get something to help me get over this thing. So I thought, oh, well, I'll avoid the crowds. I'll go to the one at Kernersville. That'll be great. That'll be a, a good idea. I get there. Well, they welcome me. I'm sitting there in the mask. Then they go tell me to sit in the sick sick section it's all glassed up and wandered well and there are other four other people in there i've got my mask on all that stuff take me back take my temperature it's not unusually high they kind of they tell me to go back and sit in the sick section some more and i sit there and the people that were around me well i felt like a picture of health after i'd spent two hours with them and I kept waiting. I haven't, I've been a long time since I went to an emergency room. I did not understand that the average wait time in, in North Carolina for an emergency room visit, the average, the best then, is two and a half hours. That's what our statistics show about our health care. I mean, you're probably like some of you. You're like, well, I've waited eight, ten. You know, I've heard of those stories too. Two and a half hours is the average. I don't know that. I wait for nothing for two and a half hours. I barely wait for the post office to bring my presents in two and a half hours. But I have to. But I sat there in the sixth section with my mask on, not feeling good. Finally, at two hours and about 20 minutes, I said, that's it. I went up to the counter and I said, I'm leaving. They said, oh, well, you've got to sign a form that you're leaving against medical advice. I'm like, I hadn't seen any medical advice. <laughs> but I said, I'll be happy to sign your form. I signed the form, and I left. 
I thought if I could have just got over a little something, I could have pushed through that and got going again quicker. I went home. I decided I felt better after leaving than I did while I was there. I think it was mind over matter. Preachers are not always the heroes. Don't do that if you need to go to the emergency room. Stay. But waiting is not easy for us. Go to a restaurant. They say, oh, it's going to be a 45-minute wait. I'm like, it's not that good. You know, it depends on which one it is. Some of them have the, the stuff in the grocery store. You can make your own. It's the same frozen stuff they serve you at the restaurant. 45 minutes? No, thank you. I'll wait just a little while. But Advent is so aggravating. Waiting, 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 waiting. Preacher always talks about Advent. Every time we've got to wait. Did you not know that that 99.5 has been playing Christmas carols and songs since October 31st? Preacher, come on, I know this. I've only started listening to it a little bit this week. Friday morning I went... 99.5, I'm ready, you know. It's the same cheesy songs. I don't know why we we get so excited about them. If you think about them, they're just cheesy. But they're so good. Why is that? Why do I want to hear Bing Crosby sing from the 40s? Because it's so good. It brings up a spirit of nostalgia. And all the crazy hair-pulling craziness of every holiday that is experienced in families... Somehow there's nostalgia in it and we think about how wonderful it is. Or we hope to, with friends, family, with, with shopping, you know. I remember growing up, Grandpa would always, we'd go to, we would take off and go Christmas Eve to the mall. Those people on Christmas Eve were crazy back then. Like, I've got to get it together. Yep, waiting's over, time is now. Worked in retail, we used to have a guy and he would come in and it'd be like the first week for Christmas and, and he would, people would walk in and they said, oh, oh can we help you? And he, they're like, oh, we're just looking around. His famous line was great. He said, time for looking's over, it's time to shop. <laughs> Time's about up, waiting's over. Anticipation is here now. And yet... Preachers and churches year after year say to you at this point of the year, whoa, slow down, wait. I say it to myself too. To wait and be reminded of what is promised through Scripture. Yes, we just finished a a Christian year last Sunday. And we began a new one this Sunday. This is the Advent. This is the newness. This is the new life in the life of the church. This is when we do say, prepare for the baby Jesus. And we also say, remember the promised return of Christ. Oh, I couldn't have picked a better scripture this morning. It talks about the flood. No, in the ark, you can get it. Look at Tate Street. I'm sure it was full of water. It always is, even when it rains just a little bit. We turn into Lake College Place in our back parking lot. Visitors have to stay till the sun comes up, so the water will go down. The lake shows up, and then it disappears. The flood... The flood here in Matthew is not talking about how horrible the world is, how bad it is, because that's what we associate with the flood. Matthew's trying to say they were not ready. They were not prepared. They were not anticipating the coming of Christ. Not ready. Then these things in the field. Now, I always, I'll admit, I've thought about this. Like one is standing in the field and one is gone. It's more of the rapture kind of experience. Oh, one of my friends in seminary had the bumper sticker he would place on the back of his car and it said, in case of rapture, can I have your car? He figured he'd be left behind. Somebody's got to do the work. Figured it'd be him. 
And that's kind of what we associate it with. It's like, you know, all of a sudden we're sitting here, you know, and like, you know, y'all be gone, I'll get left behind. Who knows how it'll work out. That's, that's what we associate with kind of some of this rapture. Then we have to work for a thousand years. Things have come along. Not what it's, what, what one commentator kind of opened my eyes and said that it's more like a kidnapping. There are two people in the field working and one is suddenly got, kidnapped, taken. That says a little bit of difference. It's, it's a little different. It's, it's a little more startling because I think it's more possible. So our mind can kind of resonate with that. But it's be ready. It's like at night. If you know somebody's going to come rob your house, do you go to sleep? Well, it depends on what time it is and how tired I am and what I've done that day. And if I'm sitting by the fire that's nice and warm, watching, you know, one of those shows I've seen a hundred times before, and suddenly at 9.30 I realize I'm asleep, If the robber comes at 10.15, it's probably safe. Probably come in, take the whole house. Penny would be asleep too, my golden retriever. So therefore, nobody would know, nobody would care. And yet, if I know that somebody's going to show up at 10.15 at my house to take my stuff, not my stuff, don't take my stuff, you better believe I'm going to be awake. Going to look like, you know... uh, Beetle Bailey with my uh, flashlight out front of my house watching. I'm going to be prepared. Only if I know when they're coming. Scripture tells us we don't know the hour or the day. I always love that when people talk about, oh, the end's coming. The end is coming on September the 24th at 2 p.m. You know, there's some prognosticators that say that. and You know, my granddaddy, you know, John Hagee used to say that every once in a while. The world's coming to an end. 2000, you remember the Great Scare? The world was going to shut down. You were going to be, everything was just going to quit. Computers didn't know if they could do 2000 as the date. Oh, it was just, oh, what, 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 what stress that we went through. Some of these preacher types, they're like, oh, the end's coming. Here's my book. You buy it for twelve ninety five or nineteen ninety five or whatever it was back then. Those books are still around. Some of those preachers are still around. They got another line now they're selling books on. But they weren't quite ready. And, and I don't know. I think maybe perhaps somebody over the years has picked the date that God had in mind for the end to come. Okay. And God said, nope, that's my decision to make, not yours. I'm changing my mind. It'll be when I want it. You won't know. It's okay. God's divine sovereignty is God's ability to change God's minds if God so chooses. I'm not going to interfere with God. No, you can't. Nope, not my place. Not our place. To anticipate, to wait, is hard. It's not what I want to do with my spare time. I want to have everything laid out. I want to have everything done. I want to be ready. I want to be aware. And it's hard. It's hard for us, people of faith, to slow down in the world and say, oh, it's just about Christmas. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. You know, I haven't heard that start this year. Can we say Merry Christmas or not? You do realize that the alternative, Happy Holidays... Holidays comes out of the root for holy day. So if you're saying happy holy days, holidays, you're saying happy holy days. And it encompasses a lot of the variety of God's creation and magnificence. And for a lot of the people who insist on saying Merry Christmas, their life sure acts hateful after the January 1 or 6. Christmas is not an announcement, it's a way of life. Christ's presence in our lives makes a difference. It should. If it doesn't, 
Maybe we need to go back and wait a little while longer. It's not done just yet. Yeah, to put Christ in the center of our lives. The things that stir Christ's heart stirs our heart. The suffering of people, hunger, sickness, war, economic inequality, educational limitations, racism, sexism, homophobia, things that stir God's heart should stir our heart. And we keep, keep, keep going to transform our world. Now you're saying, preacher, do you not know me? I, I don't have that much power. I'm not the president or I'm not the king or queen of England. I, I am just me. I'm just me. It's all I can do. Oh, I think the little Christmas song, Little Drummer Boy, so wonderful. What could I do for the king? What could I do? Only thing I've got is my drum. I'm going to play my drum. I'm a little drummer boy. The kindness that we share is all what God has given to us. The gift that God has created us to be is all we've got to share. And that's what Christ invites us to follow him with. What we've got. Do what we've got. We anticipate, we wait, and we continue to work for transformation in the world to align our hearts with God's heart. The hope that comes through Him is what we offer the world. Yep. It's not about presents. It's not about, you know, just tons and tons and tons of candies and eats and goodies. It's about Christ's presence in our lives and the transformation for the world. One commentator defined this alertness as making preparation for uncertain certainties. Making preparations for uncertain Certainties. Yep, it's going to be different. We don't know what's going to expect. We don't know what's coming at us. But we know that God goes with us through the Spirit that lives in and through us for the world, that we're not left alone, that we're not meant to suffer, and that Christ's presence is with us. That transformation still is occurring. Oh, get ready. Keep waiting. Keep going. Keep revealing God's kingdom to the world. Our glory, honor, and power be to the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen.